Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Mailbag episode 18. It's uh, late November. I don't know if we'll have one next week. We'll see if I can record one early. Next week, uh, next Thursday is Thanksgiving. We record these on Thursday, so we'll see how that happens. Uh, thanks to Alan for filling in for me last week for some storage stuff. I uh, hope you guys got all that out of your system because I ain't answering any more <laughs> of those storage questions. Um, first up, Jackson1467 asks, Some motherboard manufacturers tout using Intel Gigabit Ethernet, while other often lower price motherboards use Realtek. What's the difference, and why is the Intel controller considered better? Um, this this started a long time ago, actually. So Intel controllers used to be faster. One, they used to be able to get closer to their gigabit speeds more reliably, um, and then they were more efficient. Right? They use you could use less CPU resources while you were transferring at high speeds. Uh, I will say, um, while the the system efficiency reasoning still stands for the Intel over something like Realtek. The performance wise, it's not really necessary anymore. There's there's plenty of PCIe bandwidth, there's pl plenty of, of bandwidth, uh, bandwidth on those controllers. So I don't really worry about um, the performance of anything like that. Um, and then there's also like the killer networking is kind of the new thing and it adds a bunch of uh, uh, QoS stuff and other software services around that. So that's why uh, Intel Gigabit was such a big deal. Although I will say that their advantages and the importance of having it have lessened over time. Next question comes in from Nikolai who asks, could you please ask Josh why he has a drawing of an F4 Phantom on the back wall of his office? Also, totally separate it appears. Do you think that multi-GPU tech will ever make a comeback with DirectX 12? I think we answered the the, the multi-GPU stuff several weeks ago. Um, I kind of don't. I want it to. As somebody who just got into $1,200 Star Wars graphics cards that I want to SLI together in a system, um, I do want multi-GPU tech to return. Uh, although I just, I don't, I haven't seen the drive for it recently, right? And uh, now that with the X12 and Vulkan, the developers are more responsible for it than, say, NVIDIA or AMD, I think it's still just going to be a significant uphill battle. As for the picture, I did ask Josh about it. He did reply to me. It is a limited edition print of an F4 assigned to the North Dakota Air Guard uh, group called the Happy Hooligans. And the reason that is important to him is apparently he had an uncle that was a member of the Happy Hooligans that was killed in a training flight up in Alaska. So not to try to bring down the the mood of the mailbag, but you asked the question, we answered it. Josh provided Josh provided the answer. So it's a it's a neat story, nothing else. Uh, and I, as a big air flight type enthusiast myself, I find that kind of stuff really interesting. Next question comes in from Mike Fox. If you can't overclock them, can you undervolt a locked Intel CPU for better thermal performance? Uh, yes, you can, actually. Uh, all, obviously, this all depends on your motherboard, if they integrate support for it. A lot of times, if you know, if you're on a laptop or you're in an OEM system, you go into the BIOS, they're not going to have those type of options. But if you buy a typical board from Asus MSI Gigabyte EVGA, uh, and you're not, getting, you're not worried about overclocking, maybe you're putting it in a small form factor system or... You know, some, something to that in that regard. You have to use a low-profile cooler, so you're you're more concerned about thermals. You should be able to go in there and turn the voltage down, but then keep in mind you still need to run the same stability checks as you would when you were overclocking and adding more voltage, right? So, because uh, it's very possible that as you decrease the voltage sent to the processor, that the uh, uh, stability of the system could be compromised in that way. So keep in mind, you know, look on forums. It's it's probably there's less information out there on that specifically than on overclocking. Um, but if you start slow, start decreasing voltages, you know, a little bit at a time. Uh, one thing to keep in mind as well, and I don't know how many motherboards do this, but I know my experience with the most recent Asus boards, a lot of times the voltage settings will be dynamic. Um, so even if, say, the default is, you know, one volt and you decide to make it 0.9 volts, uh, Asus the BIOS in its default state may actually still increase the voltage up to get where it needs to get, you know, at a certain clock speed, thinking that it's helping you out by making things stable. So look at the settings, make sure you're doing fixed voltages, not offsets or anything like that uh, when you look forward, when you look for those things and uh, give it a shot. But yeah, you should be able to do that even if you can't overclock the processors. <clears throat> Next question comes in from Ryan Thompson. For those of us with slower or older CPUs, what kind of game settings hit the processor hard? In other words, what types of settings, anti-aliasing, tessellation, texture quality, etc., can be turned down to ease a processor bottleneck, not a GPU bottleneck? 
Uh, that's actually a, a tough question, Ryan. I would I would say that all three of those that you mentioned, and anti-aliasing, tessellation, and texture quality are not going to affect your process. Right? Texture quality is more going to put pressure on your graphics memory system and memory capacity. Tessellation is very much on your uh, the tessellation compute capability of the GPU, and then anti-aliasing is absolutely a kind of uh, into the pipeline graphics subsystem thing to worry about. Um, we were talking uh, before we started recording, <clears throat> some of the guys and I, we can't really come up with any specific class of settings that really fit into that. You know, anything that mentions AI is obviously going to be that. Anything that mentions you know computer uh, routines or anything like that, like AI. Uh, uh, you know, NPC routines would do that. Um, the other stuff would be anything that is going to drastically increase your draw count. Now, that's not something that they put in settings for games, but, um, you know, you mentioned tessellation. And, and, and though tessellation probably is is enough of a, of a hardware accelerated thing at this point that it wouldn't be a problem, you know, anything that you can decrease that would lower the number of items on the screen at any one time. So, you know, foliage, um, you know, you probably don't want to do anything that's going to change what they're going to have the same number of characters on there. But say you're in a game like Assassin's Creed, and I don't know if this is the case, they had a setting that lets you decrease the size of the crowds or something like that. That would lower your CPU bottleneck as well as your GPU bottleneck. Um, but it would lower your CPU bottleneck because there's less things that the driver and the API system need to keep track of in real time. So that would be the only thing I could think of. There aren't anything else that, that really stands out to me. Um, although I'm sure some settings in the games will have more impact on that than others, right? And some, you know, are, are more memory dependent for the GPU or compute. And I'm sure the same is uh, the case for main system memory, as well as uh, primary processor compute. If anybody else uh, watching, listening has suggestions on that or some examples of modern games uh, and what settings actually affect pure processor performance, I think it'd be an interesting discussion uh, to walk through. Christopher Worthen asks, can you explain why you did not include overclocked performance numbers in your 1070 Ti and 1080 reviews? I understand that stock performance is important, but it feels like a big piece is missing without looking at overclocking. Um, I would, uh, so I do generally include overclocking results. Uh, and by results, I mean how far could I clock this processor? How much of an offset could I hit on a 1070 Ti? What was the sustained clock? compared to the sustained clock at a stock frequency. Um, th so there's a couple reasons, right? <clears throat> First, not including overclocked performance numbers is a matter of what do you think is a good baseline comparison for people to make? Um, because overclocked, the overclock ability of card A versus card B is going to be different, right? The, the performance that you can get with your 1070 Ti is going to be different than mine based on binning, based on luck of the draw, all those types of things. And reporting on any one of either one of those, the best case scenario that you got or the worst case scenario that I got is unfair to both the consumer and the company making the product, right? Overclocking is a above and beyond extra, you know, take it if you can get it type of, of feature. It's not really, it's not guaranteed. It's it's definitely not guaranteed, either on the processor or GPU side. So the reason not to include those results is because I feel like if I happen to get a really good 1080 that overclocks exceptionally high, uh, well above average, then if I include that in my 1080 results as I compare it to a 1080 Ti or to a 1070 Ti, and maybe those cards overclock poorly, then I'm artificially increasing the 1080's proximity to the 1080 Ti or increasing the, the distance between the 1070 Ti and the 1080. And I just don't think that makes a lot of sense. And I also think it is more confusing than it needs to be. It doesn't it doesn't have to, to, to do that, right? So <clears throat> in general, my stance is we go with the baseline performance that's where we set our comparisons from. And then once you overclock, that's a totally different subject, right? Um, th so that's 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 the reasoning for it. I know there are a lot of other people out there, reviewers and, and YouTube guys, that really only look at the overclocked settings. And that's, I mean, I guess that's fine for other people. It's it's always, I think it's always good for review or for readers and consumers to have as many different viewpoints as possible. I just think that um, because of the extreme variability of overclocking, from unit to unit, 
uh, that it that it can confuse the market more than more than help it. Question from Robert Galloway wants to know: It seems that every time a top tier GPU is released, it can almost handle 4K 60 FPS gaming at ultra settings. But a few months later, games become more demanding, and we have to dial things back to 1440p. As 4K becomes more common, do you think that a flagship GPU will ever stay ahead of the curve? I mean, we'll get there eventually. I would agree with you that, <clears throat> well, I, I would disagree and say that I don't know if we've ever been able to say that a card could do 4K 60 Ultra. But what I will say is if you talk to NVIDIA, you know, having released several generations of cards in, in successive years that they all claim this is this is the 4K card. This is the 4K card. But it's always 4K with some caveats. 4K less than 60. 4K less than ultra settings. Um, and then as we have improved, you know, we went from 900s to 10 series to Titan XPs, whatever it happens to be. We're we're getting we're getting better. Um, yeah, games are getting more complex. You know, you look at Assassin's Creed. You look at uh, you know Battlefront Two. These are are incredibly visually stunning games and yes they're going to add you know battlefield one they're going to add visual uh things to their game engine that are going to improve uh image quality at the expense of compute horsepower so um i just don't think it's happening as quickly as that i, I think the real bottleneck was gpu performance not an increase in cpu or in uh, software gaming complexity right i just think there was a point, say, when the 980 Ti came out, that how do we how do we market this card? 4K, 4K is how we're going to do this. This is the 4K card. Um, and when the 1080 Ti came out, it was the same way. It was a 4K card, even though realistically, I think everybody on both sides of this table understood that. Not really, not really. Um, especially once we start getting into 60 hertz, we're going to get into HDR. We're going to get into above 60 FPS 4K displays in the not too distant future. Um, you know, ultra widescreen resolutions as well. Same types of things. Um, it's always going to be a balancing game. But yeah, I think eventually GPU hardware will will crest that and then we'll move on to uh, 8K or whatever the hell is going to be next for us there. All right, next question from <clears throat> Lambda, Lambda Ghost. Why does an Intel make dedicated graphics cards? This is a timely question, Mr. Ghost. Um, they don't. They used to a long time ago, probably before you were into computers. They used to make what was it, the i seven forty or seven forty i? It was a it was a discrete graphics solution. Um, it was fine. It wasn't great. It was fine. Um, they don't make dedicated graphics cards because that's not the emphasis of their company. It hasn't been the emphasis of their company. It's been on core processor technology. It's been on connectivity. It's been on networking, um, more recently storage, uh, and discrete graphics. Graphics is hard. Ask AMD. Graphics is hard to do. Even though you have a ton of people that have been doing it for a long time, you have a ton of experience, keeping up with somebody like NVIDIA who has been iterating successfully <clears throat> for the majority of the last 20 years, 15 years, um, I said majority, not all of it, is is tough to do. It's expensive. And I would say up until the last two or three years, the value of a GPU has been relegated to gaming, PC gaming, which is a flat to slightly growing market, but not growing quickly, um, or consoles. And that was just something that Intel didn't want to do. Now, because of the extreme growth that NVIDIA has seen in the data center world with AI and machine learning and you know uh, uh, cloud compute based cloud rendering all that type of stuff, there's a is a much larger field for discrete GPUs to address than just PC gaming graphics. That is why you see um, Intel hire Raja Kadori from AMD to build discrete graphics because they see that as an important part of their portfolio. Uh, in the next, you know, several years, right? It's why AMD is putting the pressure on with Radeon Instinct brand for the uh, for the enterprise markets. So, Intel will make dedicated graphics chips again soon, um, but. I'll be curious if in three to four years, if the PC gaming market is still strong enough for them to warrant to enter that space where you have to get partners or you have to handle support yourself or you have to do a whole bunch of other stuff to fit into that particular marketplace versus using your dedicated graphics as you know, the second part of an APU or um, the part you sell on a server to accelerate you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence compute stuff. So it'll be interesting to see. 
Uh, PSL2C wants to know whatever happened to Ifinity. For example, can an RX 560 drive two or three displays and report it to the operating system as a single large display? As far as I can tell, yes, all of this still exists. Um, AMD Ifinity, uh, NVIDIA Surround is still a thing. It has just become uh, less emphasized by all parties, gamers, developers, and uh, uh, these these GPU vendors. Mostly because, you know, I think it's a small market. Uh, in the same way you've seen a regression on support for multi-GPU like SLI and Crossfire, it's, because, it's not because it was totally useless or it wasn't neat or cool or helped gaming. It was that it was a very small market, it was expensive to develop, and the return on that investment was, was relatively low. I think the same thing with Ifinity and Surround, not to mention the advent and creation and, and growth of these 21 by 9 or ultra-wide displays, right? So now you can get an, uh, uh, you know, a 34-inch ultra-wide 3440 by 1440 display, which is not as, as wide as a true Ifinity or Surround system would have been necessarily in terms of aspect ratio, but it's good and you don't have to worry about bezels you don't have to worry about configuration and software drivers it reports as one display and one resolution and it all just kind of works so i think that's really where that has gone as far as i know everything is still supported um we just we haven't tested it in a while and we haven't been asked about it in a while so i'm glad you did because it you know now i can make sure i remember that as i go ask about all these different driver updates and stuff um so it'll, it'll be interesting see if that changes I, I just don't again i like multi-gpu like multi-gpu i don't think it's a big push from anybody maybe maybe somebody will shock me maybe amd will release their giant software push this december and it'll have this amazing ifinity or multi-display tech in it that that really brings that back to the forefront and gets people interested and excited so uh and our last question comes from c note is there any technical reason the gtx 1070 ti could not have used the faster GDDR5X memory. I was hoping that faster but higher latency memory would reduce demand for the cryptocurrency miners. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. I, I was kind of hoping for that as well. I don't think there's any technical reason. It's the same memory controller. Um, it's just clocked a little bit different. <coughs> um, it's really probably a cost and availability issue, right? The 1070 Ti is really close in perf already to a 1080 um, in terms of core count and frequency. So they needed to hold back the perf a little bit. So, you know, lowering it to G5 instead of G5X at slightly lower frequencies, uh, it kind of helps with that as well. It also helps them uh, lower the price 50 to 100 bucks compared to the 1080 uh, in order to, you know, maintain differentiation across the different lines. So um, I don't think there's any technical reason, just positioning reasons, pricing reasons. Uh, and I would say to... In, in your comment of reducing the demand for cryptocurrency miners, I, I think I just checked today uh, for another segment we were doing, and I found the EVGA uh, SC edition of the 1070Ti selling for 469 bucks, which is the expected MSRP price. So maybe that bubble's finally dead or is on the dying side of things, I hope, right? And everybody can just move on with our lives and we can play video games like we were supposed to be doing this whole time. Um, so keep that in mind as, as you're looking at these things. Now it's time to maybe reflect back, look at Newegg, look at Amazon, see if you can actually get these cards at the prices you expect. And now we don't have to, maybe we can stop blaming cryptocurrency for all this stuff. Not that it was fake blame, it was legitimate, valid blame. Um, but uh, maybe we won't have to worry about it quite so much. So uh, that's going to be it for us uh, this week, guys. Thank you for, for hanging out and, and sending in your questions. Again, if you have questions for me, um, they could be holiday themed, personals themed, technical themed, whatever it is. You know, we're gonna we're coming up through Thanksgiving, through Christmas. It's gonna be a busy time for us. People are away and 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 vacationing and visiting family, whether they like to or not. Um, so send over any questions you have about hardware or uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever holidays you celebrate. All that stuff is fair game. You can leave them in the comments to this YouTube video, or you can leave them in the comments on PCPro.com where we link to this video. Uh, either way. Uh, all are welcome. Thanks, guys. See you next time.